we bring you Killer Wives, episode 36. Murder at Poolside. These are the case facts against Susan Polk, who stabbed her husband to death. Isn't trust a bitch? Orinda, California, a quaint Pacific town famous for its picturesque views at 495 feet above sea level also made famous for the murder of one Dr. Frank Polk. Typically beautiful 83 degrees fall day in the town of Arenda. Arenda is 25 miles east of San Francisco, 7 miles west of prestigious University of Berkeley, and ground zero for all of the fun in the sun one can literally handle. But neither fun nor sun is what one estranged and vengeful wife is seeking following a self-imposed break from her marriage. She is driving back to the home that she has a restraining order to stay away from with deadly intentions. Susan Polk, mother of three, has been driving for hours to give her husband, Dr. Polk, a piece of her mind for reducing her spouse's support and retaining full custody of their children and the family home after she walked away willingly. But the good doctor, who is a well-known psychiatrist and teacher in this field, at the University of Berkeley is not expecting her with or without the restraining order. If he had, the doctor might still be alive with us today. Climbing those hills on a predictable path towards their shared $3 million wooded estate, Susan has one repetitive thought that replays over and over again in her head. How to get rid of her husband once and for all in one fell swoop. These thoughts have been merely fantasies for her before, but today she intends to carry them out. Finally, Susan arrives at the front door with her key, only to discover that the lock will not accept at her former house. But Susan knows that there are other side doors that are typically left open by the family, and it is these doors that will allow her access to kill her husband. Once in the home, she makes a beeline for the kitchen, where she will draw a strong-handled knife from the drawer. She knows exactly which knife to use to accomplish the mission because she has used this typical instrument to cut meat for an undetermined period of time. She looks around in the family home for a blunt object to assault her husband with. She needs this for the intentions of knocking him out or unconscious prior to stabbing the life out of him. Her next move will be to exit through the sliding glass door and surprise him from behind in the guest quarters of the estate, where he had momentarily moved after going through a recent bitter breakup with her. The doctor, who sleeps in an armchair normally during the day, will not be expecting her or anyone else for a few hours as he is off at this time, and his third son Gabriel, who the mother has abandoned, is still in school. Wielding a blunt object in her hand, she raises her arms above her shoulders and bashes over the right side rear of her skull. The doctor, startled now, falls to the floor, dazed. Looking to see where and whom the attack came from, he is surprised to see the face of his estranged wife. She has now exchanged the assaulting object for a sturdy kitchen knife as a weapon of her revenge. Like a maniac on a mission, she repeatedly brings the knife up to a high arch and then on repeated stab movements towards the vulnerable dazed body of her unsuspecting husband. Dr. Polk, with his wits only half about him now, from his head injury, attempts to fight off his attacker with his arms and feet 
as she stands both in an attempt to rid herself of her marriage. This crazed and bitter wife does not stop stabbing her husband until he is dead from 27 puncture wounds. Considering her job done, she will leave his body there for upwards of 24 hours until his young son finds him on the night of the second day. After she is sure that he is lifeless, she retreats back into the house, walking through his blood with her bare feet in the direction of the main home. She has a few hours to kill, pardon the pun, before her youngest Gabriel gets home from school. Over this time period, she will retire to the shower to rid herself of his blood along with any evidence of the crime she just committed. She will wash the murder weapon she stabbed the professor with and replace it back to the drawer for a later meal prep. Satisfied with removing all her connections with the heinous crime, she will end her cover up by washing her clothing in a machine with bleach. With sufficient time remaining, she receives a bewildered son home who wonders why she is back at the house she abandoned with a restraining order. The first thing her son will ask her upon seeing his mother on the first day is where's dad? The record will show that Mrs. Pope will reply, I don't know, I haven't seen him all day, but aren't you glad he is gone? Again, this line will be a lasting and punishing one that will come back to haunt Gabriel once his father's body is discovered. Gabriel will begin an exhaustive search of the property that will last until the night time of the second day for his father. He will do this because he remembers that his mother on many occasions has said that she has the intent of killing her husband through shooting, drowning, or running him over with a car after subduing him. On the even of the second night, Gabriel knows something is amiss. He cries out for his father during a search. Dad! Dad! He cries out. The last place Gabriel searches are the pool house to which he finds the doctor laying dead on the floor around a locked side of the house. The last place Gabriel searches are the pool house to which he finds the door locked. So he goes around to an unlocked side access. It is here where he finds his father's lifeless body on the cold tile floor of that addition. He believes immediately that not only his father has been shot, but shot by his mother for as much blood is on the scene. Running towards the exit of the pool house, Gabriel grabs a portable telephone and exits out the side door to hide and dial 911. After a horrendous police department arrives on the scene, they have no concrete evidence to tie Mrs. Polk to the murder of her husband due to the extensive cleaning job she performed just prior to them getting there. When informed about her husband's death, she will tell the police point blank, that's okay, we were gonna get a divorce anyway. Now, although police thought that this was odd, they released her after questioning. The next morning, Mrs. Polk arises to what she considers a good day, without a care in the world, without a care about what she has just done. She retreats to the house to pet one of the only things she loves in this world beyond herself, and that is the family dog. What Mrs. Polk didn't count on in her bid to gain control of the family's multi-million dollar estate and her husband's wealth is that now police considered her the murderer. You see, because of this, she would not have long to enjoy that mountain view or the petting of the family dog that she loved so much. You see, Mrs. Polk was arrested the following morning after police discovered Dr. Polk's body cold on a Spanish tiled floor, a very expensive floor, if I might add. Now, while in custody, and in the process of an interview, authorities revealed to the mother of three that they had matched a rather large grouping of her hairs that were wound tightly in a professor's dead hands. Now, usually in a fight where somebody's trying to defend himself, they get a chance to grasp somebody's hairs. And in this case, those were her hairs. Now, additionally, the only footprints that led away from his body were her bare footprints. And this placed her squarely at the scene of the crime while it was 
uh, fresh because of his body has not been discovered until 24 hours later. So you see, if her footprints were dry, then she was the only one that was there while they were wet. Now her very small footprints frozen in those uh, steps, which means that she was the attacker who didn't contact the police about the incident, or anybody for that matter. Now these two rather odd occurrences for a woman who hasn't seen her husband, as she claimed since she arrived back home on that rather large trip. Now, if those two damning facts weren't revealing enough, the DNA scrapings performed underneath the good doctor's nails reflected her involvement in the case. Now, and a lot of times this works well for women who are assaulted, but they work just as well for men. Now, Mrs. Polk, similar to other killer wives, believes falsely that just because she had little regard for her husband's life, the society as a whole did too. Now, this is a fallacy of hatred in any relationship and that it blinds you to the truth that only you hate that particular person. Now, everyone that the doctor knew missed him immediately to include his sons. When he didn't follow his predictable schedule to meet his younger son, as he had promised everyone that knew him in a loving way was out looking for him, including the university staff to where he worked. Dr. Polk, at the time of his death, was an instructor at the California Graduate School of Family Psychology and an occasional consultant as well as a private practitioner. So this guy was not the run-of-the-mill average sewer worker. He would be missed because he provided great counsel. Now here are a few more facts about his estranged relationship and subsequent death at the hands of his wife. So in 2001, after being married for almost 20 years, Susan Pope filed for divorce. This was a complicated and contentious proceeding during which each spouse contacted police with allegations of domestic violence. Domestic violence. But before the divorce was finalized, Susan had abandoned her children, her husband, and her home, and she was looking for a place to live in the state of Montana, and possibly another boyfriend. So that was a large distance to travel from where she was to Montana. In 2002, after Dr. Polk claimed that Susan had abandoned him, the courts granted Dr. Polk sole custody of the couple's minor son, Gabriel Polk, and sharply reduced Susan's alimony payments. Now, Dr. Polk also won sole possession of their house. Now, I'm pretty sure this pissed Mrs. Polk off. Now, police records indicate that Dr. Polk reported threats from his wife, and I'm sure, like I said, she did, because she loved the money. More than she loved him. On Wednesday, October 9th, five days before the murder, Mrs. Polk returned out of the blue to her former home to retrieve her belongings and complete her dental procedures by having a permanent crown put on her tooth, or so she said. On Friday, October 11th, her eldest son, Adam, came home from UCLA College to pick up his dog. Now the following day, Sunday, October 13th, Dr. Polk, Adam, and the youngest son, Gabriel, drove Adam and the dog back to UCLA to wish him well when he went back to college. Now, Dr. Polk and Gabriel return home at around 9.30 p.m. This would be the last time that Gabriel would see his father, Dr. Polk, then age 70, alive. Now, Dr. Polk was found face up the next day, Monday, October 14, 2002, dead. A forensic pathologist noted that Dr. Polk had defensive wounds on his arms, his hands, and feet. Numerous stab wounds to his chest, including a five and a half inch wound that punctured his lung, and a laceration to his head that appeared to be the result of a blunt force trauma to the right rear of his skull. Then Mrs. Polk, his aggressor, too was cut and scratched and had red discoloration around her eyes, bite marks on her hand, and a red welt on her shoulder. Now these marks on her body are proof positive Dr. Polk put up a struggle to save his life from a very unwanted attack by his wife. Just a, You're watching just a, Eminem, just the a, Men's just Channel. A, because I, because I, because One Susan case finally came to trial. Prosecutors sought a conviction of murder in the first degree contending that Susan Polk planned the murder of her multi-million dollar husband strictly for the cause of money. And a lot of these killer wives' cases are for money. Now, if you remember, Susan Polk first denied knowledge or involvement of Felix Polk's death 
And then when she was caught in a lie, claimed self-defense. Now, asserting that after years of beatings and sexual abuse, the doctor brandished a kitchen knife against her. Now, she stated that at the moment she was able to wrestle control of that weapon away from him and stab him instead. Listen. As a victim, she was able to wrestle control from the knife from him and stab him instead. Now, it would appear that if she was going for a murder based upon self-defense, it would behoove her to say that he attacked her instead of saying she attacked him. Now, she also wanted the police to believe that a small wife would have easily wrestled a knife facing her from a full-grown man with ease. Now, as I've said before, and I'll say again, most killer wives will always hide behind their gender as a weakness when they need to. Now, especially in the case of murder. Now, this is opposite of the behaviors they carry behind closed doors when they berate, slap, push, and in short, abuse their spouses. Because they know this is away from the public light as opposed to when they walk outside with makeup on. Now, time and time again, I have always heard the excuse that she has either been sexually assaulted or abused by her husband, although none of these claims are ever reported nor substantiated by anybody who knows the person. So in effect, we the general public end up literally taking the words of a murderer against a victim that is dead and cannot speak for themselves. Go figure. But the self-defense claim was not the only ruse that would be introduced into the case. No. Susan Spoke lawyer had an ace of his sleeve. Now he introduced a forensic pathologist that was friendly to Mrs. Polk's lying cause of self-defense. Now as an expert witness, so-called expert witness, for the defense, forensic pathologist Dr. John Cooper testified that Felix Polk's death was caused by heart disease and that his stab wounds were not life-threatening and were evidence that Susan Polk delivered them in self-defense. Amazing. We could wrap the case up. This guy has figured out a lie. Now, in short, it was asserted that Dr. Pope died of natural causes during the attack and not at the hands of his wife. Are you kidding me? Is this doctor real right now? Is he real? Who would say such a thing? But Dr. Cooper failed to appear in court the following day to continue being cross-examined and to present documents he claimed now, he claimed to receive from Susan Pope, sending a written explanation to the judge. He returned with the letters a week later to resume testimony. Now, prosecuted attorneys dismissed Susan Pope's claim, arguing that she had no defensive wounds from her husband's alleged attack. Now, if somebody attacks you, especially with a knife or a gun, there's a human tendency to throw up your hands or feet or whatever forward of your body to defend yourself. These she did not have. Unfortunately for the cause of justice, the court was forced to declare a mistrial when the wife of Susan Polk's then counsel, Daniel Horowitz, was murdered in an unrelated incident. Now, following this incident, Susan fired her attorneys to represent herself. Now, Susan's subsequent trial, after that, she asserted her self-defense allegations based upon a history of marital and professional misconduct, now, including claims that Dr. Felix Polk had drugged her and sexually assaulted her brainwashed a couple's children and threatened to kill her if she tried to leave him. Now, a lot of these stories and the accusations come right out of soap operas, nighttime dramas, and romance novels. They repeat it like they mean something. Now, she also claimed to be a, a psychic with for, uh, foreknowledge of the September 11 attacks that could have been used to thwart the attacks if her husband had prevented her from alerting authorities. Now, asserting that her husband was an Israeli spy who was passing her uh, psychic predictions to elite Mossad special forces in the country of Israel. Now, if you're wondering, yes, Mrs. Pope was out there by herself with these outlandish claims. Now, Susan repeatedly requested a second mistrial, lodging accusations of conspiracy against the prosecutor and the judge. Now, during her closing statements, Susan Pope, who had refused to pursue a line of defense based on mental illness, it would have been better if she went that way, Question whether the public perception that she was delusional was coloring opinions of her guilt, not the public's opinion. The fact that you're delusional colored society's opinion. Now, each of Susan and Felix's children testified at trial, and this is something. 
The youngest son, Gabriel, who had found the body, testified his mother had speculated about means of killing his dad in life weeks before his father's death. It was a constant, he said. Now, during her trial, however, no evidence, no eyewitness account supported Susan's allegations of abuse. However, Susan's own children and police reports filed during the marriage showed that Susan was an abusive spouse and batterer. And it's amazing, her husband survived a Nazi death camp as a young child, only to die at the hands of his wife. Now, Susan and Felix eventually had three sons, Gabriel, Eli, and Adam. Two of the children testified that Susan was mentally unstable and habitually spoke of murdering their father. Now, also during her trial, Susan's unnaturally close relationship with her son Eli raised many concerns and questions about a possible incestuous relationship between the two. But that had really no bearing on the case. Now, the oldest son, Adam, also testified against his mother and received widespread media coverage when he referred to her on the eyewitness stand as Cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Now, a similarity made to the national cereal brand that you probably ate before, but he was saying that she was batty. Now, the middle son, Eli, the only one of his mother's side, testified on Susan's behalf falsely that his dad was unstable, apparent in the relationship, and that he was the more threatening one. Now, although jurors agreed that she killed her husband, the doctor, they disagreed that the crime was premeditated finding her guilty of second-degree murder instead of first-degree murder. So she got a leg up on that part. On March 7, 2006, her second trial prosecutor, Paula Secura, gave this opening statement in what would prove to be a high-profile trial with spectators, TV legal analysts, and reporters showing up at the Martinez, California courtroom to watch the spectacle of Polk's representing herself and repeatedly bickering with the judge and prosecutor. So she was going into the case to lose. Mrs. Polk's delusional and confrontational behavior was on full display with daily recriminations leveled at the judge, the prosecutor, and anyone else who would contradict what she was saying. Polk maintained her contention that there was a vast web of conspiracy seeking her conviction and that the crime scene had been tampered with and that her husband, was a vile man and she was justified in murdering him. Justified in murdering somebody who'd been with for two decades, that I will never understand. Susan Polk also claimed that she was a psychic who predicted the September 11 attacks, like I said before, and that her husband was a secret Israeli spy. The fairy tales are true and other equally sensational claims. Justin, you're watching Justin, MNN, Justin, the Men's Channel. Justin, Because I, because I, because Those who couldn't attend the trial in person would follow cases daily on various internet websites and legal talk shows on TV. Adding to the drama was testimony about the, the Pokes by her two sons, Adam and Gabriel, and testimony on her behalf by her second son, Eli. Now, Adam and Gabriel, the son whom Susan let find his father's body, described Susan as angry, delusional, and a violent person. She was subsequently sentenced to prison for a term of 16 years to life. Polk was eligible for parole in the year 2017, just a few years back. But she failed to secure her coveted freedom because of the attitude and lack of remorse she took to her hearing, which is similar to what she took to her original trial. In short, she pissed those people on a parole board off. Prosecutors argued that the killing of Phyllis Polk was a cold, calculated attempt by his wife to gain control of his multi-million dollar estate. When Susan Polk permitted others to represent her, the defense attorneys argued that Susan Polk had long been controlled, abused, and battered by her husband. Now, although these claims had never been substantiated and were contradicted by the couple's children and acquaintances, as I said before, and she acted in self-defense when he flew into a rage and attacked her. Now, this was said by the defense attorney. Now, in court, Lawyers do have to represent you without any pride or prejudice. While representing herself, Susan Polk made an outrageous, unsubstantiated claims, endless recrimination, tales of conspiracy, psychic fairy tales, and secret governmental agents. Now, I'll give you an update on this case. Susan Polk appealed her conviction, but the court denied her appeal. She had her first parole hearing in May uh, 2019, where she again represented herself. 
as she had with the Judge Brady, she repeatedly ran afoul of the parole board. The board ultimately ejected her from the hearing and denied her parole. She won't have another shot at parole until the year 2029, based upon her own attitude at the parole hearing, based upon the attitude that she took to her original court appearance and her second court appearance, and based on the same attitude that she killed her husband and blamed it on him. For Killer Wives, this is Charles. We hope to see you again next time.